Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Matt Gallus. Uh, I am a HEMA instructor and researcher based out of Belgium. Uh, my focus is, uh, was originally the German martial arts, but over time it sort of spread to pretty much uh, cover the entire gamut of European martial arts. And one of the things that I've been looking into over, I don't know, maybe probably the last 10, 15 years uh, has been historical rule sets. And it's interested me because I think that's an integral part of HEMA and it has a lot to offer us. And uh, that is gonna be the subject of this lecture this afternoon. Next slide. Okay, so I guess the question is, you know, why does, uh, any of this matter. That's going to be the first thing that I'm talking about. The other things is uh, an overview of the common themes that you see across historical rule sets. I'll do a survey of rule sets across HEMA history, starting with ancient Rome and working up until, uh, you know, probably late Renaissance. Um, then if I have time, as time allows, uh, I'll do a deep dive into three rule sets from the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. Next. So first of all, why should I care about this, right? <clears throat> well, the H in HEMA stands for historical, right? And so it's nice to look at fencing, mass, uh, fencing manuals and take a look at old fencing techniques and bring those things back to life. And that's really what we're doing is reconstructing lost martial arts. But we should also be interested in the way those art, martial arts were practiced. Who practiced them, how they practiced them, and uh, you know what, what their pedagogy was and what the competition was, right? There's a lot to be learned from all this. Uh, and in fact, the way we do things now is often very different than the way they did things back then. And uh, what you'll see is that um, it's sometimes quite counterintuitive what you find in these rules and it makes you sort of rethink what was going on back then. Part of it, of course, may have been safety related but part of it, I'm convinced, also has to do with fencing masters trying to draw out particular skill sets and over the course of time uh, coming up with tried and true methods that did this. So there's a lot to be learned from all of this. The other thing is that competition was integral to what they did back then. If you look at fencing history, it's what they did. They fought. You know, they, they, didn't, they didn't hole up in a in a private room somewhere and just do kata, you know, two-man drills over and over again and, and never use this stuff. It was meant to be used and uh, across human history and actually before that in animal history too, you know, animals, young animals play as a way of practicing for the future. And that's what sport does in martial art. So competition was integral to these arts, so it's important for us to look at those. Uh, the other thing that's good about this is it helps dispel a lot of fantasies about medieval martial arts and Renaissance martial arts. Uh, you know, there's uh, sometimes these funny ideas that people have if you're just reading the fencing manuals and you're just thinking of things like judicial duels. Well, that was only a part of what they did. And then the final thing, it's fun and it's cool. You know, I mean, there are the, looking at these rule sets has brought things to us, okay? Um, how many of you in this room have competed? Put your hands up. Okay. How many of you have heard of the afterblow rule? Put your hand up. Right. The afterblow rule came from this research. Right. It was a, a it was a result of getting into Belgian archives, looking into old guild documents, reading the rule sets, finding out that they had this thing called the Nerslach. Did I pronounce that right? Uh, and um, that means afterblow in, in uh, Old Dutch, uh, and you know, we thought that was a cool rule and started using it. It made sense, right? So this research directly affects what we're doing, and there are other gems out there, I'm sure, that we can find and, and use. Next. So common themes across these rule sets that you will see, right? Limited attacks. So, you know, maybe you're only using uh, a cut and not thrust. Likewise, certain rule sets are only thrust, no cut. You have uh, uh, long sword rule sets that only allow two-handed techniques, right? No pommels, no half sorting, uh, you know, no one-handed blows, right? There are all kinds of limitations on technique. Uh, limited targets, you know, you have rule sets that said only the head was a target. 
You have rule sets that said only the hand and arm were targets. Uh, you have others that uh, used a, a plastron that covered a very small portion of the chest, and that was the only thrusting target for certain small sword rule sets. So often very different than what we, what we do now where the norm for our rule sets is the entire body. Stopping the action, right? Typically we stop the action after the first hit and an after blow. Well, there are lots of rule sets back there that didn't do that. Weighted scoring, uh, we do that now. The reason we do it now was because of experiments with the Bolognese uh, rule sets from Manciolino and various other uh, Italian rule sets that had weighted scoring. We thought that was cool. We started doing it. We combined that with the afterblow, and that's really the genesis of a lot of the rules we use today. Uh, the question of a level playing field, right? Just the very term there is a sporting term, right? We have this modern idea that, you know, if you and I are competing, we have to be on equal terms. Well, that's not always the way it used to be. And some of these rule sets you will see had an intentionally uh, unlevel or non-level playing field where one person had an advantage and you had sort of a king of the hill rule set where one guy had specific advantages and you really had to uh, pass a high bar to knock that guy out and then you got to take his place and have that advantage. So very different than what we do in most of our rule sets today. Double hits and after blows, well, you know, double hits have always been a problem. Uh, you look at historical rule sets and you will see that almost every single rule set that we have mentions double hits and how to deal with them. And there are a lot of different ways. And I don't think they had it figured out and uh, I don't think we do either. Uh, after blows, same sort of thing. Finally, uh, there, are, there are various traditions across Europe uh, that actually used bleeding wounds uh, as a way of determining the contest. So there are at least uh, three systems that I can think of that did that, right? So these are sort of common themes that you'll see as I talk about these different rule sets. Some of these will pop up now and then. Next slide. So all the way back at the beginning, okay, in terms of anything that we really have information about rule sets for, is gladiatorial combat in ancient Rome. Uh, you know, you wanna talk about fantasies, right? Everyone likes this, put him to the death, you know, the thumb down and then you, you kill the guy. Well, it quite really, really wasn't like that. And the more researchers look at ancient Rome and they look at gladiatorial combats, uh, the more you, you get the sense that there was very definitely uh, a system of rules that underlay the combat uh, and that limited it um, because uh, these fighters were actually pretty expensive. They, were an expen they represented an expensive investment. And generally speaking, the fights that took place in gladiatorial combats were not to the death. Uh, they were done until uh, submission, basically, until one of them submitted. So uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but it's just to kind of get this in mind. You know, when you think about gladiatorial combat, it is really the first truly, I think, international sport. You know, you, you find gladiatorial arenas uh, over Europe, you see, basically in three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa, pretty much the entire circle of the Mediterranean, you see arenas, and with every arena, there is some kind of a ludus, right, which is the fencing school that was attached to the arena where people were trained, uh, and uh, there were rules associated with that. Uh, you have these stereotypical weapon pairings. Uh, there are quite a few different kinds of gladiatorial uh, types of gladiators, and they fought in sort of stereotypical matches. The classic one is the secutor, who's heavily armored with the shield and the sword, pursuing the lightly armed retirus, who's uh, basically nude with very little armor and a, and a trident uh, uh, and a net, right? That's the classical gladiatorial thing. Uh, one of the things you see here is that gear is a way of shaping the fight. Rule sets are all about shaping the fight. Bringing, creating the kind of fight that you want to see. We don't have access to Roman rule sets, but we do have a wealth of information about Roman arms and armor that were used in gladiatorial combat. There's a huge amount of pictorial data that comes from that. And what you see in everything except the, the guy, you know, the nude guy with the net, is that everyone is, is pretty heavily armored. And what you see is that there's a shield that covers the left arm. You see there's something called a manica, that covers almost the entire right arm. 
uh, and often the front leg uh, is armored and, and the head is, is armored as well. So really all you have in terms of bare skin is the torso uh, and the back leg. And so that in itself, you know, the, the gear itself uh, shapes the fight because what it means, that along with the very short weapons that they use, the Gladius and the Sika, means that you had to get in close. So it's very clear that they were shaping the kind of fight that they wanted to see. So that's, uh, that's the first example. Let's, okay. Let's go to the next slide. So medieval competitions, there were across medieval Europe, there were a variety of, of types of competitions. Uh, I'm not gonna go into tournaments. Um, I don't consider myself an expert in the area of the tournament. There has been work done on that. There aren't super detailed rules uh, that exist from tournaments, but there are some. And it's important to remember that, you know, this blanket term of, term of tournaments includes both individual joust and group combats, which we generally call tourneys. Uh, and there were rules for these, and some of these rules survive. For example, there are Belgian rules uh, for tournaments uh, group tournaments that say, uh, you know, you're using a sword, one-handed sword, and it says only downward blows are allowed. No upwards blows and no thrusts. So that's an example of limitation on technique. Um, I'm not going to go into the tournaments in general, uh, but they, they existed. They were a huge area of endeavor, uh, and there were rules behind them. There are also references to fencing competitions, especially in the middle and the lower classes, uh, but no real rules survived prior to the 15th century. Uh, the first real sort of medieval rules that we have in detail are for what are known as fait d'armes, right? These are feats of arms performed by knights for a variety of reasons, part for sport, part for prestige, part for political reasons. There's a whole host of reasons behind these. But the bottom line is these were chivalric combats done in full armor to demonstrate the martial prowess of the individuals involved. And um, generally speaking, they involved combat with the lance and also combat on foot. So that's one, that's the first area we're gonna focus on a little bit. Uh, these fait d'armes were uh, governed by essentially contractual agreements called chapitre d'armes or chapters of arms that were contractual documents agreed between the two knights. And they went back and forth until they reached an agreement. And so you have these documents that will lay out 20 or 30 articles that will lay the conditions out of the fight. So you actually know what the conditions are of the fight. Quite a few of these survive. And uh, the focus of this was France and Burgundy, but it was also used in Spain. Uh, and it was also used in England. Uh, it wasn't really used in Germany, surprisingly. Um, Pretty common from the 14th to the 16th centuries. Next slide. <clears throat> so um, when those things began in the 14th centuries, really they, the focus was on counted blows. And typically what you see in the, the initial ones, the, the tradition was three blows with a lance, three blows with a sword, three blows with a dagger. Sometimes this, this took place all on horseback. Generally speaking, though, it seems to have been Three courses with the lance uh, on horseback and the blows with sword and dagger happened on foot. Again, all in armor. Pretty limited though, when you think about it. Uh, if you take a look at later descriptions of this that are a little more detailed, it's pretty clear that when we say three blows, it's not Ken strikes two and I strike one. It's Ken does three, I do three, right? And that both sides, the fight continues until both sides have achieved their requisite number of blows. So um, that doesn't sound like a lot, right? Three, three, three. Um, but remember, these were generally with sharp weapons. They were weapons of war, and it was in full armor. So there was a certain amount of risk, uh, actually a fair amount of risk, and it's not uncommon for people to be injured, but not, generally not killed in these sorts of things. And there was a Turkish ambassador who saw this once and made the comment that if this is in earnest, it's not enough. If it's in sport, they're going too far. So he was very sort of surprised by how, uh, how, er, how earnest the combat was. Okay, so this sort of morphs over time. By the late 14th century, um, you add the poleaxe to the mix, and the poleaxe becomes increasingly an important weapon. By the mid-15th century, uh, it's changed even further, so that 
the lance on horseback and the poleaxe on foot are the two focal points. Burgundy in particular is the, is the locus of most of this. You also have number inflation. Uh, so what starts out as you know, an exchange of three blows just keeps going up. You see three, six, nine, 12, and the, the top number I know of is 43. So that's 43 blows with the pole axe. That's you do 43, I do 43. That's a long fight. So, okay, let's next slide. So just an example, uh, this is one of the early ones, 1386, and this is taken. The first one is, is an excerpt from the Chapitre d'Armes, right, the agreement. Uh, you know, Sereno, French knight, writing to the English knight, asks of him in the name of love and his lady, you get this lovely chivalric flourish, that he consents to deliver three blows with steel lances on horseback, three sword blows, three blows with a dagger, and three blows with axes, okay? So, um, and then in the bottom, because this comes from a chronicle, uh, is the actual description of the fighting. They finished the encounter with lances, and they took their axes, and uh, they gave the, the three blows with them on their helmets. Same with the swords, and then with the daggers. So that gives you an idea. That's about the level of detail you get in most of these early ones. So... Um, not a huge amount of detail there, but it does suggest for those people who are doing armored combat that this is what you ought to be looking at. And I'm always kind of surprised, frankly, when I see some of the rule sets that I see uh, uh, for armored combat that really don't seem to reflect this sort of thing very closely. Uh, I guess you have the same thing in things like longsword, which uh, frankly don't really closely reflect uh, historical rule sets as well. Um, no, not really, but um, from some later sources, uh, I would say that it's probably, uh, for the armored combat, it's anything that landed. I don't, I don't believe that anything that does not land, like a blow that misses, I'm certain that w that would not be counted. But I think it's, it's a blow that either, is, either lands on the armor or is parried. That's, that's what would be my, uh, my belief on that. All right. Uh, repeat the question. Yeah, okay, the, the question was, what did they count as a blow under those circumstances? And to be honest with you, Ed, you know, we don't really know. You know, you, you go with your best evidence, and, you know, that's my sense. I may not be right on that, but that's the, that's the feeling I have. Next. So here's another one uh, that's a little small to read, but basically uh, this is a similar one. It's a description of... Uh, this is from a correspondence between a Spanish knight and an English knight. It's laying out the uh, terms for, for the combat. We're in 1400 now, and what we're talking about is poleaxe, sword, and dagger. The combat is on foot. Uh, the number of blows with each of the weapons will be as follows. Ten blows with the poleaxe, so you see the number has gone up already from three in 1386 to... Uh, 10 and 1400, that's inflation, medieval inflation. Uh, so 10 blows with the pole axe without stopping. Once the 10 blows are completed and the judge says, ho, uh, we will carry out 10 blows with the sword without stopping or separating one from the other. So there's no separation. It's, it's you know, continuous combat. Uh, and then once those are accomplished, uh, they pull out the daggers and they carry out 10 blows with the daggers. And if they lose the weapons, the fight continues, and the other guy just keeps to, gets to keep hitting. So, um, interesting, you can, you can see this here where you have, uh, nowadays you have, you have experiments with continuous, what we call continuous combat or continuous fencing. This is an example of how that sort of thing is going. Uh, these, these, uh, uh, um, uh, yeah. No, no, these are almost uniform, formally single combats between two individuals. Um, there was usually um, a lot of pomp and circumstances. These were, these were generally individuals who were up and comers in society. And, um, you know, they were, for example, there's a, a famous Belgian knight named Jacques de Lalang, right? And he, uh, he, he engaged in a lot of these. He's probably the most famous tournament fighter. And, uh, he was a, a very, very important individual. And, you know, he was a general. He was 
Uh, he was a, he was a member of the Privy Council of the Duke of Burgundy. He was a real heavy hitter, uh, and he was important in that part of Belgium. You know what's now Belgium or Upper Burgundy, uh, and so yeah. Uh, he wasn't interested in sharing the spotlight with anyone else, right? He wants to show up. He, he, there's a huge number of people watching. He's aiming to make a splash. He was doing this at the court of the Duke of Burgundy, court of the King of Spain, you know, the court of the King of Scotland, things like that. Next slide. Right. So the comment was uh, surprising that they haven't talked about grappling. And that's an interesting thing because they generally don't talk about grappling. And uh, it's, um, you, you, do hear, you do see grappling in these, but it's generally in another context that we'll get to right now. That was a nice segue for me. So the thing is, uh, you know, the, the, early, uh, the early descriptions are not all, you saw some of the descriptions, they weren't really in, in that much detail. By the time you get to the late uh, 15th century, or I should say the mid 15th century, about you know 1445 or so, you see this new format come in where the fight is until one of them is disarmed or one of them is thrown to the ground with his entire body or, or several parts of his body. And in that you see, you know, there's really no choice but to grapple in those circumstances. And uh, you know, just because you're getting later in time and the society is becoming more literate, um, you get some extremely detailed uh, descriptions of these Polak's combats. And in fact, the uh, Jacques de la Lange, the Chronicle of Jacques de la Lange is extremely detailed on that. And quite a few, if not most of the fights devolve into grappling. And in fact, uh, uh, Jacques de la Lange seems to have specialized in a particular technique where he closed in with his opponent, did a wrap with this arm, had his Polak's in sort of a reverse grip and was stabbing with the, um, with the point of it like a dagger into the face of his opponent, including cases where his opponent had an open face helmet. I got a lot of questions here and I got a lot of material to go through. So I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm, I'm gonna blaze on uh, and I'm happy to take questions at the end, but, uh, but you know, I'm, even as it is, I'm probably not gonna make it through all my material. And, and so I hope you'll understand. So, okay. So uh, the bottom line on, on this is a much more fluid fight. You hear about disarm, disarming techniques, you hear about throws and these sorts of things. And Jacques de la Lange being the classic example of this. Okay, next. Um, yeah, and here's an example from one of the Chapitre d'Arm. The third article is that we shall fight with pole axe or with sword until one of us two is brought to the ground with his entire body. Okay, and next, uh, next slide is another example, also from Jacques de la Lange. So he had actually had a, um, uh, he did a, a, what they call a pas d'arm, a passage of arms, where he basically took on all comers, and you went up and you banged on a particular shield for a particular weapon you wanted to fight him with, and then you were supposed to specify how many blows you wanted to do, but one of the knights came up and specified, uh, it, he, he refused to specify a number of blows, but said he wanted to fight until one or the other was carried to the earth with his entire body or disarmed of his pole axe with both hands. That's this kind of new format. This is in 1450. Uh, but that was not acceptable to Jacques de la Lange, who's the guy doing it. He wanted counted blows. So the judge says no, but told him, pick your number on blows. And this is the one where he says, okay, 43. So long fight. Okay, next. And actually, even though these were, come to think of it, even though the, the, that particular pas d'arm was counted blows, they definitely did grappling in there because I remember, I remember the, the accounts. Okay, so now we're gonna pop to another tradition, right? Um, uh, before I leave the, the knightly ones and the chivalric arts and, and fighting in armor, uh, what I would say is, um, I would encourage those of you who are doing armored combat to take a look at these. There's a wealth of material out there. These Chapitre d'Arm are there. They're easy to replicate. Um, just the nature of armored combat, I think, is such that you could do this. Uh, the disarm or to the ground, they did it. I, frankly, I don't see why people aren't doing it. I'd love to see that. And I'd encourage people to look at these in greater detail. Okay. 
So uh, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the German Festschule, right? Festschule literally means fencing school, but that's not what it meant. In this context, uh, what they're talking about, the Festschule was pretty much a public fencing competition uh, that would be put on by a wandering, generally a wandering fencing master who would show up, get permission from the city council to hold this, uh, this kind of public fencing competition with all the weapons that we know from the German fencing manuals, the long sword, the rapier, the dusak, the staff, those sorts of things. So very broad variety of weapons. <clears throat> uh, it's a bourgeois tradition, you know, comes from the middle class in the cities. Um, but what's interesting is they're actually counting blows. Uh, and, you know, just because of the timing of this, it, it looks to me like this is likely influenced by the older chivalric tradition of counting blows that we just talked about in an armored context. And there is a long tradition of the burghers in the cities imitating the knightly class and you know, doing jousts and imitating their fashion and, and, and wanting to do all these things that the knights do because they're the cool, the cool kids and you know, the, the aristocrats in the city and others want to do that as well. So it's possible that the counted blows that we see in the Festula tradition are, you know, something that's imitated from that. Um, but who knows? I mean, uh, you know, on the other hand, that uh, the, the feats of arms that you see in England and France and Spain really didn't make it as much into Germany, so maybe that's not the case. At any rate, in terms of the rule sets, just to go over these quickly, uh, it's very, very limited. And so this is what's interesting because we take a look at our modern rule sets and everyone wants total wide scope so you can do all the techniques in the fencing manuals and entire body target, no limitation on technique, uh, you know, continuous fighting, but no limits. Um, well, that wasn't the way they did it. That was not the way they did it. And in fact, the Festula rules are probably one of the, one of the rule sets you'll find with, with the most limitations. So what you see is they're using Cut only, no, no thrust. So the, the thrust was not allowed. Pommel strikes were not allowed. Grappling was not allowed. It's cut only. You have a limited, limited target. The hands are off target, that's explicitly said. Now the rest of the body theoretically is, is on target, um, but the fact of the matter is the, the uh, victory conditions for these matches was a bleeding wound and it was the highest bleeding wound. So where they, what they always say is strike where the hair is thickest, right? Between the, well, for most of us, uh, between the ears. Uh, that's the place where you can make people bleed the easiest uh, when, you're, when you're fighting with steel weapons. Um, and so that's what they were aiming for. So in practice, even though the body was, the entire body except the hands was target, in reality, they were just fencing for the head. So very limited target area. The fight was divided into genga, a gang literally means a go. So, you know, like sometimes we say you get three goes. That's basically where it, where it comes from. So the fight was divided into genga or rounds, each with a set number of blows. Now, uh, there were a lot of different formats clearly, but it seems like three genga, three rounds was the standard. That was the norm. And there are, are references to that being fencing custom at these kind of competitions that that was the, the tradition. Um, and then within each of those rounds, there was a set number of blows. Unfortunately, we don't know how many blows there were. Uh, it's likely that it varied. Um, this, this idea of dividing a fight, fight into rounds and a certain number of counted blows within it, and again, blows from each party. So if it's a, if it's a gong of four cuts, then uh, Ken strikes four, I strike four, and it's finished when the last one finishes his fourth. Right? Um, this gong-based fencing system never stopped. It is still in use today in the German fencing fraternities in their mensuren, which are the, you know, the student duels that they do with the saber. They still do this today. And it's an unbroken tradition from as early as we know of this, uh, you know, which is basically the, uh, I think the earliest reference to a gong is the 15th century. Uh, so from the 15th century until the present. It has never stopped. I can, in every century, I can find you examples where they're talking about this system with counted blows. So it's reasonable to take a look at some of the more modern systems like uh, the Mensuren, 
uh, that are done by the German fencing fraternities and to maybe you know project backwards from that. And what you see is that in the fencing fraternities of today, they have basically house rules. Uh, and each one of them varies a little bit, but the most common number of blows is four. It can be six, it can be eight, it can be 12. Those are the most common number, but four seems to be the most common. So in, in terms of positing you know, what you might do for a gong-based system, I think four is probably your best bet, but you're certainly not limited to that. Uh, the fighting was continuous. Again, the goal was to strike a bleeding, head to the, uh, bleeding wound to the head. The victor is the one with the highest bleeding wound. So Ken and I are on the other side you know, uh, of where we're gonna start our fight. They didn't, well, and actually that's a good question. Did they have a ring or not? I, f I found one reference to them actually fighting in a ring, uh, in a fesula. So uh, we start on the, on the opposite sides of the ring. The fencing master tells us to fight. We fight and nothing stops until there are uh, four blows struck from either one of us. And I think it's interesting that Joachim Meyer in his fencing manual from 1570, you know, when he's talking, he's teaching you the cutting combinations, he's got four cut combinations. And we also know that he was involved in that Festula tradition. He actually participated, he actually organized some. There, there are references to that. So uh, I think that, who knows, maybe that's evidence uh, that they were doing those sort of, uh, you know, four cut genga, and that's sort of how I would see it happening. You know, I'd circle Ken for a bit, and then I'd step in with my blow, and then bang, 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 right? Uh, or maybe I want to hold one back, just in case, right? But then he gets to do the same thing. We've, some of us have done some experiments with these sorts of things, uh, you know, chalked blades and things like that, uh, using, a, using genga and using four cuts per round. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting thing. I'll tell you, when you have four cuts, uh, you don't want to use them all up because you know, then you're completely on the defensive and that's not such a good feeling. You always want to have one in your back pocket. That was, that's my takeaway. So at any rate, that's the system and that's for a variety of weapons, right? That was for all of these. It was for halberd, it was for you know, the, the long spies, the long spear. It was for you know, staff, rapier, rapier and dagger, dusak, longsword. So all of these use this system. Next slide. So just a couple of uh, excerpts from rules. Uh, what would happen is that at the beginning of the rule, or sorry, at the beginning of the Feshula, the fencing master would stand up and he'd give his little public uh, presentation, basically uh, opening, uh, it's called a befriung, uh, which is basically his opening speech that formally opens uh, the Feshula. Typically he'd do what's called a parat, a flourish uh, with a long sword. Uh, as an introduction, and then he would give this very sort of formalized speech where he'd lay out the rules. And this is an excerpt from one of those where he says, uh, pommel, point, running into grapple, arm locks, kicks to the groin, eye gouging, throwing dirt, and all dishonorable tricks that some of us, uh, some know well how to use. All of that is verboten. You can't do that, right? So that's an example. And that's how those rules were transmitted. And that's what's kind of frustrating about this is that, you know, as uh, anal as the Germans were about writing down technique, they were very, very lax about writing down fencing rules, which is sort of frustrating. You get exactly the opposite thing in France and Belgium where they wrote down all their rules, but they didn't write any of their techniques. So go figure. Next slide. So, this is an example of the gong-based system, the rounds, right? Uh, this is from a Feshula rhyme, and it's talking about how uh, this guy named uh, Nikol Dacha uh, and someone just known as the Zimmermann, the carpenter, uh, they accomplished 12 ganga, 12 rounds. Neither one of them was able to hit the other. This took place with the Dusak, and they just had to let it go, give it up, right? So what, what that tells me is you know, there are some gong-based systems where you, you basically, you fight in some of the German uh, uh, mensuren, for example, you'll just fight until someone gets bloodied. Uh, but that's fairly rare. 
usually it's counted blows, but that tells me it's got to be counted blows. You know, you're, you're doing 12 rounds. There's something that stops it. So 12 rounds with a do sack, uh, neither one being able to hit the other. Um, that's pretty impressive. To put it in perspective though, uh, there is actually a later account that talks about, actually it's about a, it's a contemporary account that talks about the fencers coming with the wooden do sacks and fencing and how, because they were made of wood, it was very difficult to draw blood. And so they didn't, you know, there weren't many prizes awarded. And the next day, all these Dusak fencers had their faces all swollen shut. And, uh, and they just looked horrible the next day. But he said when the staffs came out and the long swords came out, then the blood was flowing. So next slide. And that was from this one. And this is, this is from the Befreiung, right, the opening. Of the uh, of the festula where they're announcing it, and uh, it says, uh, so that you're aware, heed what I say. The elector who's holding this event is offering money as often as one strikes a blow, making the highest hit, so long as it bleeds. So it's blood money. Think of the level of violence in your tournaments today. If we told you, you get ex you get pocket money for striking a bleeding blow on your opponent, right? So. <clears throat> So four gulden, uh, that's pretty substantial money for a person back then. So therefore, flourish your arms, don't let them rest, and let no one then value his skin too highly. So pretty interesting. So this was one of those uh, uh, traditions where you know, a bleeding wound was actually used as the measure. Uh, others are the English single stick system where they, they uh, fought with single sticks for what they call a broken head. And a broken head formally was when you got a bleeding wound on your head that bled typically an inch. So an inch of flowing blood. Uh, and there were similar systems in France and Brittany, stick fighting systems, where they did the same thing, fighting until uh, blood. All right, next slide. So now we're gonna jump traditions. We're gonna jump next door to France and Belgium. So what's interesting here is uh, you know, in Germany, we, we know about the Marksbruder and the Federfechter, right? And these are two big fencing guilds that pretty much cover uh, not just Germany, but pretty much the Holy Roman Empire, right? And uh, they both eventually had imperial privileges that allowed them, gave them pretty much a monopoly. Uh, in France and Belgium, it was different. There was no unifying, overarching body with a captain like you had for the Marksbruder and the Federfechter. It was localized in each town. Uh, and so you had fencing guilds in each town. Uh, but the practice was very uniform all across Belgium, all across France. And so what you see, and actually even in the Netherlands, and so what you see is pretty much a uniform tradition of fencing guilds from the very top of Europe in Belgium and the Netherlands, all the way down to the bottom of Europe on the Mediterranean in southern France, and, and that whole swath in between. And their fencing hall statutes are very similar. Their fencing rules are very similar. And so it's, it's interesting to see this, uh, this, uh, these rule sets that transcend national lines and also linguistic lines, right? Because France and Southern Belgium, of course, speak French. And then the Netherlands and uh, the Flemish portions of what's now Belgium, of course, they speak Dutch, right? So, but you have very similar rules and very similar fencing hall ordinances on both sides of the linguistic lines. So that's kind of an interesting data point. So the, uh, these documents go from the 15th century up to the 18th century. So the weapons of choice were longsword as a foundation weapon, rapier, and rapier and dagger. Those are the three weapon combinations that you see. And if you think about it, one's a two-handed weapon, one's uh, a, a single-handed weapon, and one's a double, you know, what, armas dobles, as the Spanish would call it, double arms, one in each hand. So you got that sort of gamut covered there. These competitions took place up until the French, Re French Revolution. Most people don't realize. Long sword competitions in Belgium up until the French revolutionaries came in and dissolved the fencing guilds took their statues of St. Michael made of silver and melted them down. I'm still pissed about that. So, um, pretty cool, uh, but uniform rules uh, all across. So let's go to the next slide. 
Sorry, what? It's also the old Champagne Fair trade route. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Okay, so Franco-Belgian rules, in brief, you have a lottery system, right? So what happens is everyone shows up and they pull a lottery ticket. <clears throat> and in fact, if you were a member of the guild, you were obligated to fight in certain tournaments. Um, the one who draws number one is the king. Uh, so he goes first. And then the guy who draws number two is the guy who's gonna fight him. And he's the challenger, the champion. Different guilds call him different things. The goal is to dethrone the king and replace him, right? Uh, each competitor has a limited number of lives. Actually, the term in French is venu, which literally means, you know, uh, come, uh, as opposed to the Germans who go. Uh, sort of funny, but it's called venu, and in English it was sort of corrupted into veni, is what they called it. So you said, essentially it's like a one point life, right? And so to dethrone the king, you have to hit him what's called a clean hit. And, and there's a lot that goes into a clean hit. So uh, that means it has to be on a valid target area, which is above the waist and above the elbows. Uh, it can only be given uh, with, with longsword, uh, only with a blow, not a thrust. They used the flat of the weapon. They chalked the blade so that you could see the marks and they wore black. So Hema black is historical. There's specific rule sets that say to make this easier, uh, everyone's required to show up in black. Um, but the thing is, remember I talked about a uh, level playing field. This is not a level playing field. The king has a privilege and that's, uh, that is the privilege of the after blow. And it's kind of worded in different ways, but uh, if there's a double hit, uh, it counts for the king. If there's an after blow, you know, the king has an after blow. So you hit the king, uh, a nice clean, what appears to be a clean hit, he still has a chance to hit you back. And depending on, uh, they don't, we tend to view that in terms of tempo now, the next tempo, that's not how they did it. Uh, they did it by steps. So the king has to deliver it immediately, they would say, uh, within a certain number of steps. Some it's one step, uh, some, it's three steps is, is what I've seen. And I've actually seen rule sets where they scaled back the number of steps that the king uh, could take because he was just chasing people down across the fencing hall and that got a little out of control, I guess. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this is they had a rising target system. So what would happen is you come out there, you know, Ken and I fight, he's the king, I manage to uh, hit him on the shoulder. Uh, and then he comes in, you know, with a cut to the head and I parry it or I avoid it, I get out. So that's a clean hit. I hit him, he didn't hit me. Yay, I'm the king. The king is dead, long live the king. I come into his place, but what's interesting is the target area changes, right? So it used to be anything above the waist and anything above the elbow. Now it's changed because I hit him on the shoulder. It has now risen to the shoulder level. So now... When I fight, so Yuval comes to fight me, and now Yuval has to hit me, you know, uh, from the shoulders and up. So it's, it's a changing game, and uh, frankly, we still haven't really figured out the ins and outs of it. Uh, at first, when we started experimenting with this, we thought, uh, yeah, you want to hit the guy as high as possible, because then it means that when you fight him, uh, he's got this little tiny target area, it's easy for you to defend. The problem with that is that if he actually hits you there, that's your after blow target area too. So, so if he hits you, it actually has the effect uh, of evening out the contest. And so after experimentation, you know, sometimes some people think it's actually to keep better to keep to hit the guy on a lower target. So you keep your after blow target more open when you become the king. So these are interesting things. Now these rules were in effect. Uh, I have indications that they were in effect as early as the, uh, the 1400s, but for sure they were throughout the 1500s, uh, the 1600s, and the 1700s. So for at least, say, 300 years, these were in effect. And obviously, it created a kind of fight that they liked, for whatever reason. I suspect part of it was entertainment value, uh, but part of it was, was things like, uh, it brought out certain behaviors that they like to see, certain technical behaviors. What you find is when 
the blows, when the target area go, moves upward, you get more technical fencing, people are doing winds and binds, and you get some really cool stuff that comes up. The other thing is the limited target area takes those, you know, pesky hand snipes out of, uh, you know, out of consideration. So you don't have to worry about that. And, uh, you know, because frankly, hand snipes, well, that's a particular skill, but it's not that hard to learn. Getting into the deeper target is a little harder. And so you can see something similar that took place in, in foil, small sort eventually, where they limited the target area to the body. So these uh, rules took uh, applied to all the different weapon systems, but what you see generally is the longsword was generally cut only, and the rapier was generally thrust only, uh, and no cuts allowed. Next slide. Okay, now, um, so that's kind of the overview of this. Uh, this was in France and Belgium, right, and also a little bit in the Netherlands. Uh, but the documentation isn't as good. So this is, uh, I know we've got some French speakers in there, so I figured I'd leave it in the original French. This is from what's called the Chatelet Ordinance. Uh, it was a document, an archival document that was found. It was transcribed. Unfortunately, the, end of the original is no longer there. It was supposedly in a folder that, was mark that marked it as being uh, from the, the reign of Francois I, of France, which is basically 1520s to 1540s, that era. That era. Uh, so that's probably the time period that this comes from. Uh, this is the earliest uh, we have of some indication of, you know, sort of an afterblow. And and I'll just paraphrase this. Uh, it says, and uh, to win the jeu de prix, right? That's the the prize play, basically, uh, because this is taken from a fencing hall ordinance, and it's got this little snippet of rules in there. So it says, it talks about how you, you know, when and how, and you know, the rules surrounding how you hold these prize plays, these tournaments, uh, and then it goes into the rules. It says to win it, this is how you do it. The blows that are commonly used in this kind of competition are from the belt upwards, and from the elbows upwards up to the top of the head. Uh, where the touch is most valued, right? So that's what you see from that point onwards from this sort of 1520, 1540-ish thing is that's the standard target area that you see all across France and all across Belgium. It's from the waist and up, it's from the elbows and up. Next slide. So here's another one a little later on. Uh, and this is the earliest indication of something like the after blow rule, right? Except this is uh, on double hits. It says, but the blows cannot be foray. Foray, a coup foray is basically a double hit. So, and if they are foray, if you, if you have a double hit, they, are, they do not count for the assailant. In this case, the assailant is the challenger. Uh, that is the truth. But for the defender, that's the king, right? That's the guy who drew number one. Uh, they, they serve him well, uh, and they, are, they count as a valid uh, touch, and there is no doubt of this. So this is your initial indication of, you know, that lack of a level playing field where you get, you know, the king's privilege, as we tend to call it now, uh, where, you know, the guy who's, you know, the king of the hill has that, has that privilege. And how exactly... They characterized a coup foray. We don't really know because they, they didn't, don't go into that much detail. Still, a lot of this was must have been oral. You know, for every sentence we have, there are probably 10 pages of oral custom behind that that we'll never have access to. Next slide. Um, so this is kind of interesting because I told you that you have a certain number of lives, right? So uh, if Yuval is the king and I come up against him, uh, and I hit him, but he hits me with an afterblow, I lose, right? So I lose one of my lives, and I go to the end of the line, and the next guy comes up and fights him until he loses, right? Um, now, most of the later rule sets, it's a set number of lives that you get, but this early rule set is really cool because it conditions your number of lives on how deep you are into the guild, because the fencing guild had this sort of, you know, staged membership, where first 
the novice comes in, he swears an oath, gives money to the fencing master, uh, and that's for each weapon. He has to swear an oath and pay money to learn the basic jeu, right? Which is the basic techniques, the basic game of that weapon, the play of that weapon. Uh, and, and if he hasn't done that, he's not allowed to compete. So if he's done, if he's taken the oath and had the basic training, he gets one life. If he's gone further on, uh, and if, if they say he's passé en roue, that means basically what we would say enrolled, uh, that's a, a deeper level of membership where you become a permanent member of the guild, uh, then he gets two lives. And then uh, if he has uh, passé en défense, which is uh, pa literally passed in defense, that means he's undergone some kind of a test, you know, probably similar to the scholar's test that you hear about in England, then he gets three lives. And this is brilliant if you think about it because this guild is not just for fun. This is a money-making endeavor for the people there. You see, when you read these, I haven't put up the fencing hall ordinances, but it's all about, about milking students for money. And if you think you have it bad now, man, read these fencing hall ordinances and you know, you swear, you spit, you, literally, you belt your fart, there is, a, there is a fine. And it's all about pulling money out of you. And so what this does though, is for each of these tournaments, there was typically a money prize or a prize of some value that was you know, up for grabs. And so there was money to be had. And so this is a way of sucking people into the guild and drawing them deeper and deeper in because they say, well, shoot, you know, if I had a little more time with Yuval, you know, if I had another go with Yuval, I'm pretty sure I figured out his game and I could take him out, but I've only got one life. So maybe I'll enroll because I can get some money out of this. So it's a very cool thing. Next slide. Okay, now we're gonna jump forward in time a little bit more. Uh, this is actually, you know, still contemporary with those other rules, because, you know, I said, both the German Festschule, the German Festschule went on until the 1700s at least. The, you know, the Fence, Belgian, the Franco-Belgian rules went on until the 1790s. Uh, this is, you know, uh, developing parallel to that is the small sword, right? And that is, you know, this fancy new weapon that everyone's doing. And actually it's kind of becoming real popular right now in HEMA. So, you know, nothing changes, right? So this is a rule set. Uh, I've just copied the whole thing. This is originally, there was a, a fencing master named Laba who was in uh, Toulouse in Southern France. And he wrote a fencing manual and at the end of it, he included the rules for the competition that took place on a, on a yearly basis in Toulouse. And uh, there was an Irishman named Mahone who uh, wrote his own fencing manual. And, uh, and basically it's a translation of Laba. And he also did a bad translation or an incomplete translation of the rules. But at least this is the, the Irish variation of Laba's uh, 1696 rules. So all thrusts from the neck band to the waist band are counted as good. Now, mind you, the misspellings there are, blame that on Mahone, that's not me, okay? So what you've got there is, uh, and I, I didn't say this, um, the head was valid target in the Franco-Belgian rules when you're cutting, right? With a long sword, you're using the flat. Whenever you're using the thrust, the face was off target, right? That's pretty common. Uh, you know, prior to the advent of the fencing mask that, you know, the, the face was off target. And you see that it actually carried forward in time and the face continues to be off target in foil. And I think that's just a carryover. So from the neck down to the waistband, everything in there is considered good. The French version actually goes on further. So that sounds good, right? It sounds like your waist is here and your neck is here. It's a pretty big target, right? But the French version actually says, yeah, um, from the belt to the neck, uh, but you, you tie the, the belt about a foot below the chin. So that's actually right up to, it's actually like your ribs and higher. So it's actually, it's not down to your, really your waistband. Uh, it's actually a little plastron that is pretty much from your rib cage up to your neck. And it says, the French version says, within the seams of the shoulder. So literally for small sword, on these historical rules, 
you have something that's basically about a foot by a foot square, and it's only the front of the body. So it's really kind of interesting how, how limited the target area is here. So the next paragraph talks about coup foray or interchange thrusts, that's double hits. Uh, they're not counted on either side, so they just throw them out, uh, except one of the competitors has recourse to it in order to make the thrust equal. Then the thrust of the other is good and not his. What that means is a subject of debate. Some people see that as essentially forerunner of uh, right of way. Uh, some people see this as uh, seeing that second blow as an after blow. Uh, you know, I'll leave it to, I'll leave that just as a matter of debate, but it's an interesting thing. It's a different way of dealing with it, right? Those Chatelet, the Chatelet ordinance that I put up there, you have not a level playing field, and the, the coup foray, the double hit, is valid for the king, but not for the challenger. Here, we're on a level playing field, right around 1700, um, and double hits are thrown out. So in this one, if one hits the body and the other the face, the thrust on the body is counted and not the other, you know, because it's already off target. So basically, if one hits off target and the other one hits on target, the on target uh, is valid. Next, next slide. This is interesting too, right? If you look at the way we practice small sword in HEMA, um, people love using that left hand. They love grabbing the blade. They love hand parries. Uh, and, and it was definitely off limits. Uh, in both the French version, this Irish version, there's a Brussels rule set for, uh, they call it rapier, but it's 1716, so it's probably small sword as well. All of those uh, expressly forbid any parries with the hand, any grabbing with the hand. Certainly fencing masters will tell you in their fencing manuals that it's a skill you need to have, um, but they didn't allow it in competition. And, uh, you know, the main thing is it's just, it's easy to do. And uh, uh, it really quickly devolves into, uh, into either A, a very ugly fight or grappling. So there are the rules on that. So those are, uh, and, and it's interesting because they see it from reading this, you, it's clear that they see it as kind of unfair as well. So next slide. <clears throat> so if parrying, binding or lashing, I think it's beating the foil, it falls. So if, if you knock the weapon out of the other guy's hand and you hit him without interval, then that is good. Two-handed thrusts, shifting from right hand to left hand, that's not allowed. Two-handed thrust with a small sword or foil sounds weird, but of course that shows up in quite a few fencing manuals, both half-sword thrusts and two-handed thrusts with foil uh, or small sword show up. Not allowed in competition. <clears throat> and then of course the master doesn't give judgment for his own scholar. Next slide. These are just a few of the original French from 1696 that weren't in there. Uh, the top one, seven, is the one I told you about where they're the one, uh, the French version actually is in more detail where it says uh, that you tie a belt uh, around the body uh, and that belt is uh, put slightly, uh, basically uh, slightly more than one foot below the chin and that uh, the top border is the height of the neck and within the, uh, uh, the seams of the shoulder, of the shoulders. So it's that very narrow target. Uh, this is the other thing that's interesting, paragraph nine there, I've just taken excerpts, that blows without interval, you can get multiple hits. So if uh, Yuval and I are fencing small sword, and I wanna show him my badassery, and I go, ba-boom, I, I hit him twice in a row, I can get two hits in one round, and it counts. And it says, uh, so they're counted as two, um, doesn't matter how it happens, uh, as long as it's marked in two places. And when they say marked, you know, marqué, they sometimes call it, they say a, a coup marqué, that's a, a marked blow, literally. That means uh, a blow that, that has created a chalk mark from the chalk that they put on the blades. And of course, with rapier and small sword, just like uh, in old school, uh, foil fencing, you know, used to have a rubber button on the top. They used to have a leather button that they would put on the top and they would put chalk on the tip of that 
to Mark, uh, and generally they were they were uh, either in black using white chalk, or they were in white and they had some kind of a red dye. <clears throat> Next slide. So, uh, hang on one sec. What what time have I got? Okay. So I uh, so that's pretty much the the time I have allotted for this. Uh, just in conclusions, you know, fencing competitions have always had rules. They've always been pretty rule bound. Even the things that you think of because of you know television, you know, uh, gladiatorial combats, uh, fights between knights. You know, come on, people are people, and and they generally. Uh, put rules on violence. It's just th something that people do. Even, even you know, uh, in prisons where you have fights, there, there are certain rules of, of conduct. These rules, regardless of, you know, whether you're looking at Roman fights, whether you're looking at, you know, uh, knightly feats of arms or German Fechtschule tradition or what have you, these rules are generally quite different from what we do and quite limited. That doesn't mean they're worse, right? It means, uh, well, in part, yeah, maybe it had to do with some safety concerns, but it also had to do with drawing out particular skill sets. And that's something to remember. Rules are a way of shaping the behavior of fencers. That's always what you remember. And every rule that you make has a consequence in terms of the behavior that comes out of the fencers. And so, you know, and of course, uh, there is always this law of unintended consequences that attends fencing rules. And you know, you wanna create A behavior and inevitably, yeah, you're gonna get some A, but generally you're gonna get some K and J and L that you really weren't counting on and you don't want. So then you gotta tweak the rules a little more. Mike Chittister, Chittister sorry, can probably talk to you a little more about that. Um, another comment, historical rules, also give insight into what historical masters thought was important, right? So even though in the German fencing manuals we see this broad range of technique, you know, you've got something else that's occurring in public and uh, somebody, uh, fencing masters who are running these competition, obviously think that's important. Uh, so in closing, I would just say, you know, these rule sets are valuable, they're worth looking into, uh, they've already contributed things like the afterblow and weighted scoring. Those are literally taken directly from historical rule sets. So they're worth experimenting with, not just piecemeal, but also what I'd like to see more from event organizers is events where, you know, they actually take a historical rule set and put it in place in its entirety uh, and then just let it play out and ideally writing down some observations so we can kind of learn from that. Because, you know, uh, what's happened with the Franco-Belgian rules has been really in instructional. And the, the behavior that we posited when we were first, you know, looking at these rules and thinking how it was gonna play out was often very, very different from what actually occurred in practice. So, uh, that's my conclusion. So if there are any questions or comments, happy to open the floor. Ken? So what about the warping effect of safety equipment? Because of course they didn't use masks and such. So what effect did that have on the conservatism of the fighting and how would we, we, would we mirror that? And that gets back of course to the whole kind of virtual right of way question. Yeah, that is, that is actually a very good question. Um, and it evolved over time, clearly. Um, in the early time periods, you just have this idea that the indication is uh, from the illustrations and the accounts that there really was very little safety equipment that was used at least for the, uh, you know, for the bourgeois and lower class fencing competitions. It's basically not a whole lot different than you see with English single stick out in the countryside. They had a basket hilt to protect their hands, but they didn't wear much of anything else. And so you had bare heads exposed to, you know, blows, repeated blows with a stick until someone bled. And so the bottom line is, you know, there was, you know, this was a bit of a roughneck sport. Uh, fencers were known as being roughnecks. Up until about Renaissance times, the fact of the matter is fencers had a very bad reputation. So 
uh, yeah, the people who were attracted to this were, frankly, um, likely to be people who were um, pretty risk tolerant, is the first thing. Uh, the second thing, though, is there was more protective equipment, I think, than people really realize. And so, um, starting at least in the 1600s, you have both illustrations and accounts of the German Festschule, where they talk about padded uh, gauntlets that covered uh, the entire forearm, basically from the hand all the way up to the elbow, uh, and that were padded. You have uh, these padded bands, uh, probably made of stuffed leather, maybe leather with horse hair, that went around the, uh, the temples to protect those areas. Uh, in Germany, France, Spain, elsewhere, uh, you, you have a lot of references to fencing hats, uh, and whether those are, sometimes they're just normal hats, people would wear a hat uh, when they fenced. Other times it was a, uh, you, you read about specifically designed uh, fencing hats that were out there, um, and the goal being to, to knock the hat off the head. That is an easy way of, uh, you know, basically um, uh, approximating a blow to the head is just knocking the hat off the head, right? Um, but, you, you can look at a lot of clubs uh, that, you know, HEMA clubs that have evolved over time and some of the early ones like to do uh, a lot of fencing without any gear and especially with no headgear. And you do see a lot of weird artifacts from that. There is no doubt of this. And uh, I'm sure there was, uh, there was a fair amount of that as well. Um, hence the development of the mask uh, as soon as that was practicable. Um, not really. We know sort of the broad outlines. We know about, we know a lot about the weapons they used. Uh, we know certain, certain rules like, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, there's a Sloan manuscript, uh, in, in England that basically describes the rules. Uh, it, it's basically the, uh, the statute book for the English Masters of Defense. There uh, are sections in there that talk about the test for mastery, and of course you had to fight to show your to show your skill. Uh, and there are some occasional mentions that indicate rules, and one is that <clears throat> you were not allowed to strike a blow and then run in, uh, core a core, you know, body to body with the other guy. So that uh, it says specifically, so uh, with a specific intent that he intent that he wouldn't be able to strike back at you. So that sort of indicates to me that they have an afterblow system, uh, and there there are uh, there is a, a there are a couple of mentions of something called an after veni. A veni is a hit or a score. So um, there are indications that they used an afterblow system, but not a lot of detail. Uh, I've never seen any detail. Plenty of things like uh, um, bills posted on the wall, posters saying, you know, there's going to be a fight at this time and it's going to involve the following weapons. And so you know what the challenges look like, you know what the weapons look like, you know what the conditions in terms of the ring and everything, that's pretty well understood. You have some pretty good descriptions of those fights, but in terms of rules, no. So we're not able to deduce much from the descriptions we have? Uh, I haven't been able to. Okay. Other questions? Okay, if there are no other questions, thank you for... Uh, it's 4.30, and I have a live stream at 5, so we've got to prep for that. So, otherwise I would. Thank you.